Lift up your voice in song to the mighty one. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. He is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the rock that stands. Glory and honor and power be unto the Lamb. Lift up your voice in song to the Mighty One. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus loves you. Jesus died on the cross. He rose from the dead. He's present right now. Jesus wants to speak to our hearts. I'm, da I'm Father Al Lauer. This is Daily Bread, and we're happy to be alive in Christ. We're glad to share the Word of God with you. We are talking about the great greatest uh, document of the 20th century probably and that's quite a statement because in this world with paper and documents coming out of our ears and millions of books and everything else uh, we, this is quite a statement but uh, the Vatican II document on the church if you ever read one thing other than the Bible you ought to read that one and we are in section 4 of a section by section paragraph by paragraph uh, pilgrimage through this great, great revelation. It's so important because we are members of the church. The Pope has said we've really got to get into this document in preparation for the third millennium and the great jubilee year. It's so important because this comes from a council, and an ecumenical council is of extreme importance. All of them are, and they continue to be. It's so important because Jesus founded the church, and the church is the keys of the kingdom. The church is the pillar and bulwark of truth. The church is the body of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. The church is the fullness of him who fills the universe in all its parts. Ephesians in chapter 1, last verse. Let's pray, Father. Oh, Lord, may we understand what's going on. Lord, we, what, may we catch on to what's, what's the truth, what's the revelation, what's the Spirit's word to the church. May we not miss out on these things. We pray all this now in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen, amen. Let's ask Mary's prayers. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. After an introduction, we talked about the very first chapter, the mystery of the church. Second chapter, the people of God. Extremely significant, but what's the significance? And third one, the hierarchical structure of the church with special reference to the bishops. Fourth one, the laity. And now we get to the fifth chapter, the call of the whole church to holiness. Now that's always been clear. Everybody's called to be holy. But the uh, Vatican II document on the church has said, we really want to emphasize this. We, we want to emphasize this to an extreme degree. If you remember our last session, or you can get the video tape uh, and re listen to it yourself if you missed it or if you were here involved, but you need to kind of review a little bit, that, that when it started talking about the laity as priest, prophet, and king, especially prophet and then especially king, gosh, the job of the laity, I mean, thank God I'm not a laity. I mean, <laughs> boy, it's just astounding what you've got to do absolutely amazing what you have to do. And when you read that in section 36, for example, it just blows your mind. You just say, how in the world could anybody do that? Section 30, um, 39, 39, as we begin this fifth chapter, the call of the whole church to holiness. Faith teaches that the church whose mystery is being set forth by this sacred synod is holy, and now listen to this, in a way which cannot, can never fail. I don't care how impossible the job is, if you're holy, you'll do it. Because if you're holy, you're in unity with the All-Holy One, and if you're in unity with the All-Holy One, you're in unity with the All-Powerful One, who can do anything and has done everything and will do everything that needs to be done. 
And, and so you get the idea. If we're holy, we'll do the job. And it's not just a matter of doing the job. If we're holy, we'll be in communion, in union with the Lord. And remember, that's the main theme of the 20th century, the main theme of Vatican II, the main theme of Vatican II's document on the church, unity. That was, goes all the way back to the very first section. If you weren't with us for that, you can get the tape on that too. Okay, let's look at section 40, some scriptures on being holy. Once again, so scriptural, Vatican II, very deep in the scriptures. Section 41, talking about holiness for various vocations. And it says, first of all, hey, bishops, you be holy. Bishops aren't automatically holy. Pray for your bishops to be holy. And then in section 41, they say, well, how about priests? And I thought this was quite interesting. Of course, being a priest, maybe I'm uh, kind of looking at this a little bit differently. But what's it mean for a priest to be holy? Does he need to be on TV? Well, no, thank God, uh, although we're on. Uh, does, does he need to be very dynamic? No, thank God. Does he need to be um, uh, very reverent? Well, it depends what you mean by reverence. Uh, how, how do we know? What do you mean if a priest is holy? Let their heroes, referring to priests, be those priests who have lived during the course of the centuries, often in lowly and hidden service, and have left behind them a bright pattern of holiness. Their praise lives on in the church. A priest has to pray and offer sacrifice for his own people and indeed for the entire people of God realizing that what he does and reproducing in himself the holiness of the things he handles. And so it talks about lowly and hidden service. It, it talks about uh, offering sacrifice. Further on, it talks about meditation, just really reflecting on what a privilege it is to be a, a member of the people of God and, and a priest of God. Then, then they talk about other clerics, for example, deacons, and then um, then they mention married people and widows and single people. And notice you say, well, they've pretty well covered all the vocations, but they get into laborers whose work is often toilsome. And of all things to bring up, they say, uh, after going through all these vocations, I like to just bring up people that work really hard. And they're supposed to be holy. And they talk about those oppressed by poverty, infirmity, sickness, or various other hardships. Yes, they're supposed to be holy. By that listing, you get the idea. If you're breathing, you're called to be holy. Okay, section 42, the relationship between holiness and love. And then also holiness, love, and the evangelical counsels of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Uh, so let me read a little bit here of uh, section 42, quoting from Colossians 3.14. It says, Charity as the bond of perfection and the fulfillment of the law rules over all the means of attaining holiness. Charity meaning love. And then it talks about uh, holiness should be expressed by a total surrender this could be expressed in physical martyrdom or at least through the evangelical councils. So it brings up the evangelical councils are not just for religious, but for the poverty, chastity, and obedience should be lived by all Christians according to their way of life. And then this leads us to chapter 6 of the document on the church. And that means religious. So they say, we just brought up the evangelical councils, which is the defining mark of the religious, at least one of them. And we said all people are to live this, but religious are to live this in a very, very special way. And, of course, they emphasize the community life of the religious and, of course, their ministry. That's brought up in section 43 and then if we look at um, section 
44. They, they talk about a more abundant fruit from baptismal grace, a more intimate consecration, a better symbol of the unbreakable link between Christ and his spouse, a, a joining... Uh, the evangelical councils join their followers to the, to the church and her mystery in a special way. They, the religious have a greater freedom from earthly cares. So the, the word, they say more abundant, more intimate, better symbol, special way, greater freedom, more and, and better and greater and special, and then, then further on in section 44, unique. This, the religious state reveals in a unique way that the kingdom of God and its overmastering necessities are superior to all earthly considerations. A lot of people, when they read this, they, they feel like, um, um, you know, they really gave the laity a uh, top billing in the document on the church. Boy, the laity, the people of God, the laity, the people of God. And remember, everybody's in the people of God. Everybody's baptized. But boy, the, it's even, and they really gave the bishops a lot of emphasis because they, that's really the practical point for bringing the whole thing up to follow up on the teaching about the bishops that was not done in uh, Vatican I. Um, but so, so you say the religious, you know, they just kind of got thrown in on the side. Boy, when you read this, I don't think it's say it's thrown in on the side. They just really exalt the religious life. Praise God. Praise God. Thank God. Okay. Now, when, when a particular way of life is exalted, um, it, you know, any exaltation has a, has a possible temptation of um, people, you know, kind of being prideful and being independent. And so in section 45, they talk about being under the authority of the church. Section 46, they, they, they talk about the religious life and says, never forget for a moment, it's to be Christocentric. You say, well, everything's supposed to be Christocentric, but this is even more so. Section 46, religious should carefully consider that through them to believers and non-believers alike, the church truly wishes to give an increasingly clearer revelation of Christ. Why did you take the vow of poverty? So that you could look like Christ, look more clearly like Christ. So the clearest look at Christ is with the religious. And it's getting clearer and clearer, ideally. Oh, that's, that, just, that just really gets me excited. Okay, and then section 47 just closes this section about the religious and maybe I'll just read a little bit of it. Let all those who've been called to the profession of the vows take painstaking care to persevere. Persevere. Come on, you nuns and brothers. Oh, we need you. Persevere and excel increasingly in the vocation to which God has summoned them. Persevere and excel and keep on excelling increasingly. Let their purpose be a more vigorous flowering of the church's holiness and the greater glory of the one and undivided trinity which in Christ and through Christ is the fountain and the wellspring of all holiness. Holy, holy, holy Lord. Okay, that's the end of the section on religious. Section, uh, the chapter 7. This is, a, this is a quite a title. To give a title like this, you got, you got to be inspired by the Holy Spirit or half nuts. Listen to this title. Remember, there are eight chapters to this great document of the 20th century, the greatest document of the Vatican II, the, old, the, uh, the one of the two dogmatic constitutions of Vatican II. And the first, well, let me go over it again. The first one, mystery of Christ. Second one, people of God. Third one, hierarchical structure of the church especially with reference to bishops. Fourth, the laity. Five, the call of the whole church to holiness. Sixth, the religious. Okay. Seven, the eschatological nature. Here it is. <laughs> this is. There's one more chapter, the role of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the church. But here's the second last chapter. The eschatological nature of the pilgrim church and her union with the heavenly church. Whoa. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what an eschatological. Eschaton means the last things. It refers to heaven, hell, 
judgment, death, second coming of Jesus, the last things. Okay. The eschatological nature of the pilgrim church. We don't just look at the church in the past, church of the present, but church of the future when there is no more future, the church of eternity. Okay. In section 48, several scriptures about the, uh, the last things, the eschaton, the eschatological dimensions of reality. Uh, one scripture, 1 Corinthians 10, 11, the final age of the world has already come upon us. 2 Peter 3, 13, we're awaiting new heavens and a new earth where justice dwells. Uh, Matthew 25 and, and verse uh, 41, it talks, it talks about the, um, um, those who are commanded to go into eternal fire. Hmm. And then they talk about uh, the, the great darkness, eternal darkness of hell, where there, we, where there will be weeping and the gnashing of teeth, Matthew 22, 13, Matthew 25, 30. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, it talks about being before the tribunal of Christ, so that each one may receive what he has won through the body according to his works, whether good or evil. John 5 and 29, at the end of the world, they who have done good shall come forth unto the resurrection of life, and they, those who have done evil, unto the resurrection of judgment. Philippians 3, 21, refashioning the body of our lowliness and conforming it to the body of His glory. Oh boy, that's going to be good. 2 Thessalonians 1, 10, glorified in the saints to be, to be marveled at in all who have believed. So they're talking about heaven, hell, judgment, Jesus' second coming. Um, wow. Uh, I, I really like that section 48, but we, we need more of that. Um, we haven't been hearing much about that. How many times do you, do you hear really preaching on heaven and hell and judgment, end of the world, second coming of Jesus, glorification of the saints? How many people are talking about that? Boy, that's section 48. That really gives you just an idea just how important it is to live for Jesus, to be in his church. Just how, how the church is going to go on. The church is, is never going to end. The church is going to go on to eternal life. So, uh, wow, it's just certainly, it's sort of different. A lot of people think joining the church is something like joining the Veterans of Foreign Wars, the Kiwanis Club, and the Elks and the Moose, or who knows what else. It's just a club. Oh, boy, the eschatological dimensions of the church, it's not just a club. How can this church, and when you see it in the light of judgment, in the light of heaven and hell, the second coming of Christ, the end of the world, when you see it in that light, how can the church just act like a club and, you know, um, sell chances on a bottle of booze to make money? Come on. Do you know who you are? I think that's one of the terrible things about our fundraising, if we want to take a digression here. It just shows we have no concept of who we are, especially of the eschatological dimensions of the church. Okay, well, anyway, you say, we need money. Don't give me this eschatological stuff. Oh, brothers and sisters, if we knew who we are, God would take care of the money. Uh, all right, well, section 49, talking about the communion of the saints. They talk about the church, the uh, traditional, the church triumphant in heaven, the church being purified uh, in purgatory, and then the church uh, in militant, battling on earth. Section 49. You don't hear that too much, but it's in the council documents. It says, um, some of of his disciples are exiles on earth. Some have finished with this life and are being purified. Others are in glory, beholding clearly God himself triune in one as he is. Um, and, and then this is very interesting, section 49. It says, when a Christian dies, their union with other Christians is not interrupted in the least. In fact, it's strengthened. When your husband dies and he dies in Christ, your relationship with him is not interrupted in the least. Not at all. But it's strengthened. You say, well, I don't get that. So what is, read that. Read that, section 49. Amazing. All right, section 50 talks about praying for the dead. Uh, because it is a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they may be loosed from sin. Second Maccabees 12:48. The church has also offered prayers for them. And it talks about the veneration of the saints. And 
we, I think most of us are used to asking the saints to pray for us and to pray with us, but here they get into a lot more. In section 50, they say we're supposed to love these people. We're supposed to thank these people. We're supposed to ask for their prayers. We do that. We're supposed to ask for their power. Now, we just more or less throw that in with a prayer, but that could be separate, and ask for their help. So I think we have this like with St. Anthony of, of uh, Padua, we don't just ask him to pray for us, we ask him to find stuff. We should have that attitude with all the saints. Do you see what I mean? Uh, we're, it's more than their intercession. And we have more than to turn to them. We have to love them and thank them. So that, that really makes you think. Okay, sections uh, 50 and 51 will we'll stress um, that that this relationship with the saints does not at all take away from the relationship with Jesus. In fact, it strengthens it. That's in section 50. And in section 51, it does not at all take away from the relationship with the Trinity, but it strengthens it. Let me uh, look at section 51. It says, Let the people be instructed that our communion with those in heaven, provided that it is understood in the more adequate light of faith in no way weakens, but conversely more thoroughly enriches the supreme worship we give to God the Father through Christ in the Spirit. Okay, that's chapter 7, the eschatological nature of the pilgrim church and the union with the church in heaven. Wow, what a, what a sentence. Uh, then we get to chapter 8, the last chapter. Now there's uh, quite a bit of controversy on whether this should be a separate document or a, a, the last chapter of the teaching on the church. It's about Mary. And the church has decided that if we could see Mary in relationship to the church and the church in relationship to Mary, we'd understand the church a lot better and Mary a lot better. So here's, a, I would say, a very bold move to help us really appreciate Mary's part in God's plan and God's church. Um, this is quite interesting. Chapter 8, this last chapter, is the only one that has official titles and sections. So it's almost a separate document, but it's still in there with the church to show the great interrelationship between the church and Mary, Mary and the church. The title is the role of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, in the mystery of Christ and the church. Every word here is extremely important. Virgin, Mother, she's both, Mother of God, they all talk us, mystery of Christ. We, I think a lot of people don't, don't understand. They think, well, um, Mary takes away from Christ. You don't even understand Mary unless you get to Christ. Now, I know you can understand Mary to a degree, but a lot of people say through Mary to Christ, yes, but more, if you want to know Mary in any depth, it's through Christ to Mary. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, even the way to Mary. But the mystery of Christ and the church. Okay, well, let me read a little section, something here from uh, yes. section 52. As we begin, this is the preface, 52, 53, 54, this preface to this great document. Um, this great end of the great document. Um, in this church, adhering to Christ the head and having communion with all the saints, the faithful must, notice the word must, also venerate the memory above all of the glorious and perpetual Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. Section 53, part of the preface in this last chapter of Lumen Gentium. It says that she is endowed with the supreme office and dignity of being the mother of the Son of God. As a result, she's the favorite daughter of the Father and the temple of the Holy Spirit. Mary, as she relates to the Trinity, she is, and this is quite important, section 53, she is one with all human beings in their need for salvation. Mary needed to be saved. She said, well, she never sinned. She needed to be saved from even from falling into sin. 
And it says she is also hailed as a preeminent and altogether singular member of the church. She's related to Jesus. She's the mother of Jesus. And then she is the preeminent and altogether singular member of the church. In fact, even the mother of the church. Um, then it, in section 54, it talks about the role. It says the purpose of this last chapter of Lumen Gentium, Vatican II on the church, is to give us the role of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the church and then our duties to her. Then after the preface, we get to, to chapter 2 of, excuse me, section 2, major section 2 of this last chapter of Lumen Gentium, and it's the role of the Blessed Virgin in the economy of salvation. And there we start getting into scripture after scripture after scripture. So we'll be getting into that in our next and, and final teaching on Vatican II on the church, Lumen Gentium. But I wanted to give you a running start here into this, uh, this, this great climax, this great ending uh, to this greatest document of the 20th century, and of course the end with Mary, and boy, that that just shows that isn't that isn't putting her on the side. She's not just an appendix; she's the grand finale. So I think this really uh, gives great um, emphasis on Mary. So let's pray right now. Well, Father, we pray through the intercession of Mary. We ask that we would receive her intercession, her help, her power, her ministry, her maternity in helping us be members of the church in the fullest sense of the word. We pray all this now in Jesus' name. Amen. He is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the rock that stands. Glory and honor and power be unto the Lamb. Lift up your voice in song to the Mighty One. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself.